Greetings, I'm Evan Hirsch, executive producer of the film and co-founder of Soul Documentary. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we get into the film, I'd like to have a brief talk with you about some pretty serious stuff. Have you noticed lately how people seem really stressed out, almost to their wits end in many cases? You probably feel it yourself. Things just don't seem to be working so well these days. And does it feel like besides voting, marching in the street at an occasional rally, or supporting some charities, there isn't much we personally can do to affect real change in the world? Let's consider some of the major causes of our stress problem. Hyper-competitiveness, polarization, and ad hominem attacks on one another. Deep programming, causing people to believe gross misinformation and remain stuck in closed-minded traps. A lack of actual problem solving, as treatment of symptoms is the main focus of our efforts. Discrimination against so many groups, whether, whether racial, gender, sexuality, religious, etc. Gross income and wealth inequality, poverty, homelessness and starvation, refugees and immigration issues. Technology becoming so complex that it wastes our time more than it helps us. Not to mention the threat of merging with the machine and potentially losing our basic biology and what it means to be human. Manipulation of information, especially in the media. Complete distraction of attention and denial of our true nature as collaborative, ultra-social beings. Pharmaceutical industry manipulation of science to keep people sick and buying drugs. Doctors who believe misguided hype and bad science, paid for by those seeking to profit off of bad health. Industry lobbying's influence on government and therefore our world. Religious influence on government, so much for separation of church and state. Dirty opponent bashing campaigns, voter discrimination and election fraud. Ineffective politicians with liberals and conservatives at constant loggerheads. Hyperconsumerism driven by psychologically manipulative marketing tactics, plastics and endless garbage, industrial pollution, melting ice caps, ocean acidification and other climate change consequences, the sixth great extinction, guns, as in 400 million in the U.S. alone, constant wars and the threat of worse, nuclear stockpiles in many countries and mutually assured destruction and a lack of any comprehensive plans to rectify this course of collective mass suicide. What are we doing to ourselves? And what are we waiting for to finally wake up for real and actually change the way we live for the better once and for all? One fundamental issue is that we've been very successfully divided and conquered by implanting into our thinking an us versus them mentality in which we blame and scapegoat rather than take responsibility and contribute to unification and collaborating on solutions. We're polarized to the maximum and lack the support to cope well, so we turn to less healthy means of feeling fulfilled or just not going completely crazy. Do you really believe that if we just vote the right person or party in that it's going to fix all our problems in this world? Let's face it, our problems run so deep that we are literally afraid to even really look at them, let alone put our attention, brain power, energy, and resources into solving them. So how do we ever possibly get out of this incredibly complicated mess that we clearly are in? I've got to admit, I'm a guy who cares, and that's why I'm doing this. I recognize that we are actually one human family, and to me, everyone matters. I came into some money a few years back, and wanting to be responsible and share it by contributing to causes that touched me, I had to really consider where to direct my philanthropy. But no matter which way I turned in my research, my effort to determine where it was best spent ended up an exercise in futility. You see, for every drop of ocean I support in cleaning, a thousand more get polluted right behind me. Fukushima fish, anyone? And for every hungry mouth I feed, a hundred fall into starvation. I could advocate for the rights of one race or another or LGBTQ people, but come on, we have to advocate for people who others feel shouldn't be able to get a job, rent an apartment, or be able to buy a cake at their wedding? Does that not seem ridiculous to you? 
how many of you can honestly say that you have hope that we will solve these massive problems, that things will really change for the good and that we can at last thrive as one human family? I used to be a guy with very little hope. I've watched many documentaries about how messed up things are in the world and how self-defeating, self-destructive, and even suicidal our culture, politics, and especially our economics are for us. And at the end of some of those, they offered a few suggestions about what we could do to mitigate the damage done, correct our course, and find a sustainable path. But I had to wonder, is it even possible? Is it too late already? Are we completely at the mercy of lunatics with their finger on that dreaded red button? How many people honestly believe that if we protest in the street, it will prevent that from happening? So what on earth can we possibly do with our attention, time, energy, and resources to make the big shift from competition to collaboration, from the hell we are in and the cliff off of which we are headed to the heaven on earth that we brilliant humans obviously have the brain power to create? I look around and I see the vast resources available to us and yet an egregious misappropriation of them as money, this godlike thing we've created, out of thin air in many cases, by the way, gets funneled to an increasingly small elite few. I see the suffering of those who don't have the money to buy what they need to survive. It just feels like such a mess. I ask you this, could there be a world somewhere in our imaginations and within our reach actually worth imagining into existence? And what would that world look like? What value system would it be based on? Who's got the blueprints for a way forward that serves our entire human family to the best of our ability? I know of only one man who walked this green earth with the brilliance and concepts to help us do those very things. I've met him and the woman who was there to support and inspire him. I've seen the plans he laid out for us and now support the nonprofit they founded because he truly was the man with that plan. Well, I told him I loved him for what he had done for all of us, and he told me he loved me too, and I truly believed him, because I could see that at 101 years old, and obviously nearing the final days of his life, that he wanted better for me, for every human in our seven billion strong and growing family, and for this precious blue rock hurling through space with all the other vibrant creatures on it, I knew in that moment that this was my true hero. A man who grew up in the Great Depression and after witnessing all the suffering that caused, devoted his entire life to finding and articulating a better, healthier, more logical and sustainable way for us. And my dear friends, I want to share those plans with you. So I proudly present our documentary, A World Worth Imagining, Jock Fresco, The Man with the Plan. Hi, I'm Evan Hirsch. We are here in the state of Florida at the Venus Project to visit centenarian futurist Jacques Fresco and his partner Roxanne Meadows, who have created this 21-acre futuristic wonderland to give us an example of what might be possible if his visions come to life for a new society for us all that is centered around a resource-based economy. The reason we emphasize machines and technology is to free man to go to art centers, music centers, cultural centers, and to find the meaning of their own existence and lives. John Fresco, interview take four. Let's take a look at this beautiful body of futuristic visionary work. Come on. What do you think of when you contemplate the future? Well, we're finding out what Jacques Fresco, a futurist, thinks about that. You may not have heard of Jacques Fresco, but he is known around the world. Documentaries have been done about him. He has a plan to build an entire new world from the ground up. Magazine writers from Europe have written stories about it. I've come to the other side of the world, to Florida, 
to meet a man who has a very clear vision of what he thinks the future of cities should look like. Offering an architectural plan for human beings, technology and nature to coexist and create a sustainable future. He's a social engineer, industrial engineer, designer, inventor. Who truly believes the ills of society can be cured only if we throw away the rules that govern it and ourselves. But to do it Jacques way, there would be no communism, no capitalism, everyone living together in one world, sharing everything. If you were to describe yourself, what would you say? I just about have to call myself a social engineer because I'm not just interested in architecture and learning theory and human behavior, but I am interested in all aspects of the earth and people, people mostly. I'm not too interested in technology, although it may seem that I advocate that. In actuality, all the wonders of technology to me are just so much junk unless it makes humans better. My favorite part of the day was the lecture itself. I've watched a lot of Jack Fresco's lectures. He struck me as a genuine person, hell-bent on saving the world in every way he can. But I think Jack has this amazing ability to zoom out and look at stuff from above about on society, on structures, on life, on people. The depression had a big influence on you. Yes. How did it change you? Well, I had to think my way out of it. I went to the library. I read many books. Everybody had a little bit of something. Jacques has been working on this all his life, and what pushed him in this direction was that he experienced the Great Depression. Well, I remember as a kid, uh, during the Depression, my father, being an agronomist, was one of the first guys laid off. And he really tried to get a job, he couldn't. And the family was threatened, and there was no provisions for that kind of condition. And I remember seeing millions of Americans displaced, and children riding freight trains across the country. They were good kids, they just couldn't make it. And people were sent out of their house because they had no money for the rent and people in bread lines. And that's what initiated people talking in the streets about communism and free enterprise system and mankind united and all different things. And he felt that it was the rules of the game that we play by that were so screwed up that he started a quest of looking for a different social system that enabled people to thrive more so. And he couldn't find one. What has humanity failed to learn? I failed to learn. What makes people behave as they do is the indoctrination in schools and in magazines and in radio and news. Suddenly I realized not a lot of people understand this factor that the environment shapes us and it was, whoa, really? If you raise an American child by the headhunters of the Amazon, he will shrink heads and behave as a headhunter. You might dislike that behavior, but if you maintain that environment, you will get that as a result. When you're brought up in the slums where every kid grabs what he can grab, otherwise there's nothing left for you, you understand? You're brought up with a philosophy that parallels where you're coming from. So when people steal, I say, every human being is lawful. They obey natural law. What you've been exposed to, if it's hatred, all that is lawful. Fresco's vision goes beyond architecture. He sees his cities as tools for fostering humanistic values. I feel that environment shapes our values. The people we know, the people we identify with. It isn't human nature that people have greed. It's reinforced in this culture. And by having greed, you get more things. You get more money. You do it off of the backs of many other people. Every human being is perfectly well adjusted for where they've been. What you've got to remember is we can raise a dog to tear Japanese soldiers to pieces, or we can raise the same police dog to help the blind. How do we find our way through from the standpoint of human nature? We look at it as a scapegoat. 
They think that, well, if there is a human nature in people that they can't exceed what they're doing. There'll always be war, there'll always be hatred, there'll always be jealousy and crime. And that's just not true. From our point of view, there are no criminals. There are people that have been subject to deprivation. They've been subject to environments that had little warmth, little love, little caring. And the result and the byproduct is criminal behavior. All of our bigotry and our hatred and our prejudice and um, our notions of good and bad and right and wrong are given to us from the culture that we're raised in. You believe that we teach competition that is not bred into some... The competition is dangerous, socially offensive, considered right and normal because you are brought up to that value system. Can you take a primitive baby and make an aeronautical engineer out of them? Yes. In the last 25 years, and from a background of isolated village life, such tribesmen have driven their first tractor, have acquired and practiced totally new medical skills, and mastered the skill of flying an aeroplane. They don't have a primitive mind. They have the mind set by the primitive culture. You make more sense than about anyone I've ever heard. Why is your level of logic so rare? You can't expect a person to do anything outside of that conditioning. So reconditioning is the foundation for finding a new way? Yes. It's too difficult. Once the kids get out of school, they've already been poisoned. You know, you manage to break out of it and find your own way. I mean, aren't there enough of us out there who can make something happen? Well, that's gonna make something happen. This film. All environments generate behavior. We don't like to look at it that way. Well, I make my own decisions. No one ever told me what to buy or what to think. When you go to school, the first thing they do to you is you raise your right hand. You don't even know which is your right hand. And you pledge allegiance to a flag, but you've never seen all the other flags of the world. You pledge allegiance to the American way, and the American way doesn't exist. When I went to school, the beds we sleep in were designed in England. The electric battery came from the Arabs. It was designed 600 years before Christ. We've learned a lot from so many people, and most of us are alive because of Louis Pasteur. So we owe so much to so many to get away from patriotism. Einstein said that. To surrender our concepts of individual uniqueness in exchange for constructive cooperation and human endeavor. This is the future. Whether you can see it or not depends on whether there will be a future. I don't have any expectations. Whatever happens is real. What I think should happen is not real. That's what hurts you. Your expectations of the world. What Jock has developed, what you've developed with him in the last 40 years, it's so much more than buildings. That's right. We always say it's not architecture, it's the social design. It's a resource-based economy and it's the values that go along with it. So it's more than a building. It's The building is just a statement of some underlying philosophy yes. that has to run the world. It's like the human body. If the brain said, hey, I do all the thinking, I want most of the energy of the body, then the liver starts choking. The liver says, without me, you can't exist. Or the brain says, well, here's a little bit. The liver, liver suffers. You cannot give certain things to some organs of the human body. The whole mechanism, the planet Earth and all its inhabitants live here. And there is a way today, fortunately, only today, with science and technology to overcome these problems. Being concerned about the environment without making an environment better for everyone. And keeping that in mind is your prime directive for computers as well. Their prime directive is human concern. You can't be human or decent without the knowledge to overcome scarcity. Today we can produce an abundance for all countries so they need not invade other countries. We can provide for their needs. Who will do all the work to build it? No one. The Venus Project will be automated. Factories, farms. If you unleash science and technology to create a high standard of living for everyone and automate boring jobs. Jacques Fresca's background as an industrial designer, social engineering guru, and architect have led the 98-year-old futurist to be dubbed a modern-day da Vinci. He has a long-held theory for a more sustainable society, and his city designs are like nothing we currently have in place. Technically, 
How difficult is it to build these homes? Well, we will prefabricate like automobiles on production lines, not carpenters and hammer and nails. That's okay 50 years ago, but no longer adequate. He did the first prefabricated house after World War II out of aluminum, but he made extrusions so the windows snapped in, the doors snapped in, and everything could be built very quickly. But because he worked on extrusions, he came up with extruding entire apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. Everything's so futuristic, even today so futuristic. And when did he make these? He really made all of these designs 60, 70, and sometimes 80 years ago. He's 101, and he started designing when he was 13. We made these about 30, 35 years ago, but a lot of the designs are very old. And so you have the monorail under yes, the bridge? Yes, this is a covered bridge with the monorail underneath. And this is um, actually a very old design of his. Jacques had a concept for a train before I met him, but the train didn't, wasn't in a tunnel. It had a probe out front that shot electricity, you could say, in front of it. So it broke the air. So there was no sonic boom or where there was no air pressure and it could go very, very fast, but you don't need the tunnel. And the same thing on aircraft, he applied it to aircraft. And in fact, in 1956, he was in popular mechanics with that device. We helped to build a new transportation system that can move up to 2,000 miles an hour, floating on a, a magnetic repulsive field or an air cushion. If 40 or 50 people have to leave the train, we slow up to 100 miles an hour, lift off the passenger section, or slide it off and slide on a section with the passengers getting on. This represents the building of underwater dams within the Gulf Stream. This dam will route the waters of the sea into a spillway so that fish and marine life are separated from the turbine blades. The Gulf Stream will generate power to oxygenate the waters, to eliminate the red tide, to monitor marine life and build an ecological relationship between the total oceanographic world and the continents. Let's not wait for nature to do it. We loused it up. We're going to have to clean it up. They arrive at the technology eventually. He just worked in many fields, so he came out with things earlier. But it's the social design that's the most important. Absolutely. Yeah. We live in a monetary-oriented world. We think in terms of money. But the real value of any nation is its resources. Without resources, you have nothing. Say the ship sunk and you found yourself on an island and you had, say, $10 million and you had gold and diamonds, but the island has no water, no arable land, and no fish. You have nothing. So all this emphasis on money, which doesn't really represent anything but some way of exploiting other people. When the bottom line is profit, it's very dangerous. And if you squander your resources in war, well, we have 5,500 ships on the bottom of the sea today, loaded with copper, manganese, tungsten, all the kids that were killed, 300,000 aircraft shot down. Well, World War II, we could have housed everybody on Earth, built hospitals all over the world, schools all over the world. There's something dreadfully wrong with our culture. We won't make the history books of the future. We are that ignorant. Not in technology. We're doing fine in computers, electronics, but the human value system is not moving fast enough. Governments are not changing fast enough. What have we done right? Nothing right. Yeah. These are our dark ages. These are the new dark ages, and the world might end tonight. Yes. The future isn't Star Wars, according to Jacques. It's a home for everyone. This is what I mean. We'll show a world in which values are different. The aspirations of people, they have compassion, feeling for one another, concern over the environment. Building the structures of the future may be the easy part of Jacques' vision. The real future, people will be different. Well, today, a person feels good helping an old lady across the street. But where does she go when she gets across the street? Jacques thinks he has the answer in the city of the future. When I was about 12 years old, I was looking at a gear on a table, and I saw the cities of the future. I think all inventions are based upon experiences like that. I don't think they come out of nowhere. This is what the total 
city. The total city looks like this. This is an ecological program. The cities are all immersed in beautiful gardens, where there are lakes, recreation areas, art centers, music centers, cultural centers. And surrounding the city, we have the agricultural belt, where we grow foods hydroponically. Between cities, we let everything go back to nature. In Jacques' world, bold new technology would literally change the way we live. Cybernation would free us from long work days and allow us to pursue our own interest. All of the new cities will be a university in essence. There's no courses that are used to exploit or abuse any other human being. Jacques Fresco has blessed us with his unwavering commitment and uncompromising work to re-engineer a better future. On behalf of all of us, thank you. We are getting there and you have been a critical force for that change. Please, a warm round of applause for Mr. Jacques Fresco. The whole idea of the future is to stop putting up little cities and buildings, but to work on a whole system. The center of a city, the nucleus, will house an electronic computer. The computers do not control people. They maintain safety, they oversee the environment, maintain ecological balance between animal life and plant life. All the machines do is control the physical entities that comprise the environment. We feel that machines ought to do the filthy or the repetitious or the boring jobs. That man has to be free. To pursue the higher things, the higher possibilities of man. What is to be done precisely? An international system for the maximum utilization of the world's resources without any special privileged group. There's no technical elite, no scientific group that sit on cushions that make the decisions. What form of government? Resource management government. Non-political, neither communist, fascist, socialist, free enterprise, merely the installation of resource management to enhance the lives of all human beings. Fresco poses a question for us all. Will humanity create the paradise we know is possible or will it drive itself into oblivion? The choice is ours. As automation advances and we lose all these jobs, how do we provide the food, shelter, medical care, and energy for all these people who aren't going to be able to earn it because there aren't jobs for them to do so? A resource-based economy. The Venus Project wants to use a resource-based economy, meaning we have enough resources to take care of all the conditions and problems and make everything available free, like the library. A li library for everything, a library. That's right. Yeah. There would be no money because we wouldn't need it. Resources would be available to everyone. You don't want to own anything. You don't want money. What you want is access to things. It's just no need to profit over other people's misery. You get a toothache, somebody makes a buck off of that. And we don't need to do that anymore. We can get beyond that by creating abundance. We can achieve a level of production so high that it'd be superfluous to put a price tag on things. And that's the beginning of a civilized world. The money system was designed hundreds of years ago, and it no longer fits the situation. So when this society grows up, they will understand that money is no longer necessary. They can go to a new kind of economy. No society in history ever looked into the future and designed things to fit that. They waited till, boom, the bottom, then they changed. See, unfortunately. 
we're given the notion of individuality because it fits in with this culture that you have to be responsible for your survival, your health care, and uh, we don't need to do that. We can provide that for everybody. If people have access to things, who's going to rob things from you? Who's going to take things away from you if there are access centers? If there is no money, we don't need bankers, we don't need lawyers, we don't need ad advertising agencies, we don't need stockbrokers. There's so much superficial waste. This culture, you have to sell things to keep the economy going. So we're plundering our resources just to keep selling. And people that believe in the power of money, it's so wrong. And you can't tell them that. They think you're a communist. Communism is a radical enough. Right. Communism isn't radical enough. That's a great jock quote, right? I don't want communism or socialism. That's too old fashioned. We are moving into a system, a different system and a system free of political bias. And if you elect the people with unquestionable ethics in government, and if you ran out of resources, I can assure you, crime would grow again. And the Venus Project is a redesign of our culture to design a society with the intelligent use of science and technology to lift up the lives of everyone, not a selected few. The economic alternative to most of the world's societies is to declare the earth as the common heritage of all the world's people and then remove all the artificial boundaries so people can travel anywhere on earth without a passport. And there'll be no problems such as racial, racial problems. There will be opportunities for all people. We do it because the smarter your children are, the richer my life. So everybody in the world represents an extension to their life rather than, I got just the car you're looking for. Rather, everybody's selling themselves and making a profit on one another. That will motivate them to see that everything they do goes out there to all humanity. All children are well cared for. All older folks are taken care of. So that means they will be taken care of because everybody cares about everybody else. You know, before you launch a spaceship to the moon, you want to know how many people are going to be on the ship. Is there water on the moon? And so everything you design has to be in accordance with the physical reality. People speculate about how many people the Earth can sustain and support. First, you have to do research and find out how much energy we have. The first thing we have to do is take a survey of just what we have yes. and where the arable land is, where the water is, where most of the population is, what the illnesses are. We have to take many surveys of where the technical personnel are, where the needs are, and that dictates what we do where. We have to learn how to manage real economics, not for profit, for human betterment then you'll see the beginning of a civilized world. And once we get that in, children will not understand how we couldn't see that in the old days. They'll say, Dad, wasn't that obvious that if you live to yourself, you die to yourself? You're talking revolution. No. When society breaks down. Technical revolution. But when society breaks down, then they'll want to do it a different way. I'm sorry about that, but it seems that conditions were so abusive in some lands that they put in socialism, communism, whatever, or fascism, that fits the conditions that people live under. None of them are the solution. All governments, all through history, have been corrupt. Our priorities are all screwed up within this system because it's wealth, property, and power. And within a resource-based economy, it's the protection of the environment and the well-being of people. When few nations control most of the Earth's resources, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have territorial disputes, wars, no matter how many treaties you sign, or no matter how many laws you make, it won't stop that condition. The human condition, which causes people to invade other lands, torture people, build armies to protect what they have, this is not going to work, it never has worked. It's as old as man.
So what we need is an entirely different approach to the human problem and preserving the earth for the future, future generations. We've come to Naples, Florida today to check out the Baker Museum who have curated a beautiful exhibition. We've made it up to the exhibition hall where Jacques Fresco's life's work is on display decade by decade through an entire century starting from the 1910s through the 2010s. We're here with Frank Verporten, the director and chief curator of the Baker Museum. We'd like to learn first of all, what made you decide to house this exhibition at the Baker? We are the first venue, I believe, on record the first in the United States to devote an exhibition to this subject. The impetus really for this came from the portrait of Jacques Fresco that Harry the Zitter took, I believe, in 2013. It's been a good response, really. I mean, you're gonna think this is funny, but especially the response also from different media and so many different, uh, uh, I guess, young filmmakers who are interested in this person and what he's accomplished so far. Recently, I was here with an architect um, who saw the exhibition for over 20 minutes, was not familiar with this artist, even though he, this architect is in his mid to late 50s. And he said, this is so remarkable. And he was looking at some of the designs, and he said, I can show you um, some architects or designers who are working on this sort of uh, concept right now. Like, in Jacques's case, these were designs that he made in the 60s or 70s. You know, so. These are the 50s. These are pretty futuristic, considering we didn't send a rocket to the moon until 1969. For the 50s, these are pretty ahead of their time. <laughs> but also, look at how, how serious he took himself yeah. from the very early yeah, days. Nice. I mean, this Perfect. is really remarkable. He knew he was onto something very big, and he, you have to take yourself serious. We're very proud that we were the first to, uh, to breach this um, uh, topic. So the resource-based economy is the nonprofit organization. Say they're inspired. What do you want them to do? Well, we'd like them to come to our website, read more about it. There's a lot more information there. And go to the Get Involved section where you can see all of our different teams if you'd like to help out. And we are working on the blueprints for our next project, which is called Center for Resource Management, which will include exhibitions of the future. We would also have a huge media center, an educational center, research and development, and much more. We really welcome your help. We need your help. We're not gonna get there any other way. The problems that this culture generates are endless. And that's why it's so important to show an alternative direction. We don't even know what it means to be civilized yet in this culture. As long as we have war and poverty and prisons, we're not civilized. We have the ability to do such wonderful things. So there it is, we visited the Venus Project. Jacques and Roxanne couldn't have been more welcoming and informative and inspiring. And we're taking this knowledge with us and we are here to inspire you. We urge you to watch their documentaries, go to their website, read more, do the research, and come support this important project that really gives some new hope for us all. Thanks for being with us. I didn't expect to walk by and see alligators. To see uh, an 81 years old Palestinian and a 31 year old Israeli share the same visions about peace and about love, and it's the perfect place to do it. Maybe, maybe, this is our last chance. Jock is a great visionary, bringing people to understand what a world without war, without money, would look like. And maybe we can still have our last dance. Where we have global resource management in cooperation, not competition. It's one last chance, one last chance to live.
If we fail to accept responsibility for our own future, there will be no future. Wow, I hope that moved you half as much as it still moves me every time I see it. And believe me, I've seen it a lot. I've got to share with you, making this film feels like one of the most important things I've done in my life. And the potential that you may be one of those who feels inspired and makes the effort to initiate significant change for our human family makes it all worthwhile. You may be a believer that we, the people, can truly make a big difference and lasting impact in our world as we benefit from the visionaries who have shown us how to create the kind of world that we want to live in. A peaceful world, obviously, and one where everyone in our human family has their needs met by efficiently utilizing the vast resources all around us and employing our best technology to capture and distribute them wherever they need to go. One lesson my dad managed to get through to me as a kid was, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And that led me to become a walking commercial for everything about which I speak, as I choose to share things about which I have positive feelings. And realizing that my image and personality attracted attention, I feel a duty to take responsibility for what I represent. After acting school, I could have gone to Hollywood, but that felt like it would have just served to help make money for studio executives. And being in a commercial for a product just helps to sell that product so someone can make money. Well, I finally found something that truly feels worthy of representing. Something we can all represent that isn't looking to profit off of our image, our talents, and our efforts, but that actually serves us all for the better and for the long term, including our grandchildren, for those of you who have them. We are open to talking with all who proclaim themselves seeking to participate in big change for the better for us all. We surely need those people if anything significant and lasting is ever going to get done. To me, it seems clear that the only thing standing between us and the life of our dreams is enough support to achieve it. This one will take massive support, no doubt, but there is no question that it is possible. It's just a matter of garnering enough to reach a critical mass, a consensus, a sufficient tipping point, and therefore ultimately a new way. Besides this, I have no hope. Government won't change. Lobbyists won't stop. Regulations won't all of a sudden curtail harm and exploitation. And maybe in actuality there is no hope. I don't know. I can't predict the future. But I read a bumper sticker one time that said the best way to predict the future is to create it. This clearly isn't some hippie dream of utopia. It's simply our life story to write and our world to create. Will it take lovers and dreamers? Maybe, but Jock has done so much of the thinking and preliminary planning for us already. Will it take intelligent people, skilled professionals, and some major effort on many people's part to get it going? Absolutely. Right now, it needs you. It needs all of us, or at least as many of us who get it and care enough to do something about it. It needs our interest, our attention, our help with promotion. It certainly needs money, and lots of it. I personally have been supporting the Venus Project in many ways, including funding a successful $50,000 matching grant campaign. I urge you to give and do what you can for this one hopeful cause. Let's make the Venus Project the biggest nonprofit in the world, the nonprofit to end all nonprofits, because once we evolve our human family onto a resource based economy, the obvious things like homelessness, starvation, environmental issues, and wars will be a thing of the past. And we can spend our time, energy, and ingenuity on real solutions that create a sustainable world that nurtures our entire human family. Isn't it about time? To that end, we ask that you please help others discover this film and all it represents. Thank you again for joining us.